Scandinavia has got many great things, such as high median incomes, fantastic healthcare, and excellent government support. It is sort of like a functioning society where things actually work. I know, it's all very strange. One thing that Scandinavia doesn't have, however, is a FIFA World Cup. Sweden came closest when they reached the final as hosts in 1958, the only Scandinavian nation to have hosted the tournament to date, in addition to making the last four in 1938, 1950, and in 1994. Denmark are the only Scandinavian country to have won a major tournament, namely Euro 92, despite not even qualifying, but they have never got beyond the quarter-final stage of a World Cup. Meanwhile, Norway are very much the black sheep of the Scandinavian footballing family, at least up to this point, never having got beyond the round of 16 of any major tournament, and not even having qualified for one in over 20 years. Perhaps all of that would be different if the Scandinavian countries could just set aside their differences, like who is the most polite, whether it's ethical to hunt for whales, and who did what during World War II, and came together to form a single mega team starring all of the region's best players. In that instance, how might our Scandinavian superstars get on at the World Cup? Even combined, Sweden, Denmark and Norway would have a population of fewer than 22 million people, about half the size of Ukraine, and not much larger than the Netherlands. It should be said, because there is always some confusion around this, at least here in the United Kingdom, that Finland and Iceland are Nordic countries, like Sweden, Denmark and Norway, but they are not generally considered to be part of Scandinavia. I will reflect on what a Nordic 11 might look like at the end, but I just wanted to get that clarification in early on to avoid any confusion. Without further ado then, whose last club was actually in Scandinavia, though of course that doesn't make him Scandinavian, here is my unified Scandinavian All-Star 11. Goalkeeper, Frederik Ronov. The obvious choice in goal is probably Kasper Schmeichel, son of the greatest Scandinavian goalkeeper of them all, who has won 89 caps for Denmark, and of course a Premier League title. Schmeichel is my number two, spoiler alert, but I have picked his compatriot, Frederik Ronov ahead of him, a man who has been capped just eight times at the age of 30. The reason being that Schmeichel is 36 now, and he has had an incredibly mixed debut campaign at Nice, starting terribly but having been superb for the last few months, whilst Thronov is in the form of his life right now in a Union Berlin side fighting for the Bundesliga title. That is a fight they are unlikely to win, but the fact they are in it at all is quite frankly remarkable. A well-rounded keeper formerly of Bronby, Ronov has never really been a number one since arriving in the Bundesliga, initially with Eintracht Frankfurt in 2018. That has changed this season, in which Ronov has dislodged compatriot Jakob Busk, and I think that he is the right man for this 11 between the sticks. Centre-back, Joachim Andersen. I am playing a back three, as I seem to have a bit of a penchant for doing with these fantasy 11s, but only because there is a scarcity of Scandinavian fullbacks at this moment in time, and a particular lack of genuine top-class left-backs. There are no such problems at centre-back, however, where Denmark's Joachim Andersen is the man to get us started. Capped 22 times by Denmark at the age of 26, Andersen has already played in four different European top flights, none of them Denmark's, and he has been with Crystal Palace ever since his 20 million euro move from Lyon in the summer of 2021. A towering 6 foot 4 inch centre back with a great leap, Anderson really ought to score more headed goals, but his first duty is to keep them out. Despite a recent wobble, he and Mark Gay have formed an outstanding partnership that is excellent at doing just that, and Palace have conceded fewer goals so far this season than the likes of Tottenham Hotspur and Manchester United in the Premier League. Centre-back, Andreas Christensen. The star of this backline, Andreas Christensen was touted for stardom in Denmark from an extremely young age. Part of the Denmark setup from the age of 15 onwards, Christensen was only 16 when he was signed by Chelsea. 
Following two years on loan at Borussia Mönchengladbach in the Bundesliga, from 2015 to 2017, Christensen broke into the Chelsea first team under Antonio Conte, and he kept his place, broadly speaking, without ever being truly nailed on, for most of the next five years. Last summer, after his Chelsea contract expired, Christensen joined Barcelona, becoming the second highest paid Scandinavian player in all of world football. Solid, dependable, and the perfect candidate, I think, to play in the middle of my back three as a sweeper, given his ball-playing abilities and prior experience playing in defensive midfield, Christensen's spot in this 11 was never in any doubt. Centre-back, Victor Lindelof. Whilst Anderson and Christensen were always pretty nailed on for me, there were a few good candidates for this third spot. Simon Kjaer was the most obvious option, a brilliant centre-back and someone who I've always been a big fan of. Meanwhile, you could make cases for all three of Christopher Ayer, Victor Nelson and Leo Ostergaard on their day. Were any of them left-footed, purely in the interest of balance, I probably would have picked them. But Victor Lindelof is someone who can play on the left and is fairly two-footed, despite being strongest on his right, and I think that he is the most accomplished of the lot, albeit only narrowly, at least at this moment in time. For all of the criticism that they both received and continue to receive, Manchester United conceded just 36 goals in 38 Premier League games in the 2019-20 season, with a partnership of Lindelof and Maguire at centre-back. Meanwhile, they have conceded 35 goals in the league already this season, with 13 games still to go. Clearly, the Liverpool result didn't exactly help on that front, but you know, the point still stands. I like the balance of my back three, and the fact that they can all play a bit, including Ronov in goal in fact, so Lindelof gets the nod, and you can expect total football from start to finish, from my Scandinavian All-Stars. Right wing back, Alexander Barr. Currently enjoying an outstanding debut campaign at Benfica, Alexander Barr's rise in recent years has been a joy to watch. Six years ago, he was playing in the third tier of Danish football. Barr was still playing second tier football in Denmark as recently as four years ago, before stepping up to the top flight, catching the eye of Slavia Prague in January 2021 and Benfica in the summer of 2022. Benfica paid 8 million euros for Barr. If a Premier League team wanted to sign him now, I would imagine that the Portuguese giants could times that figure by at least five. A rampaging fullback who is actually at his happiest playing as a wingback, Barr has already made six assists for Benfica so far this season, and he would fit like a glove within this 3-5-2 formation. As a result of his gradual rise, Barr has only won six caps for Denmark to date at the age of 25, but I would be surprised if he wasn't one of the first names on the team sheet, for the foreseeable future at least. Left wing back, Dejan Kulusevski. This system was great for accommodating three excellent centre-backs, and perfect for Alexander Barr. It is a little bit less ideal when it comes to Dejan Kulusevski, who one way or another, I had to get into my team. When Antonio Conte signed Kulusevski at Tottenham, he said the Swede had the potential to play at wing-back and that he was actively exploring that as an option. That is hardly surprising. Conte has never seen a winger in his entire life who he didn't think that he could turn into a wing-back, but it is something which hasn't yet materialised. An inverted winger, who is nonetheless very two-footed, that is probably because Kulusevski's output on the right of a front three at Tottenham, particularly last season, was very good. But he is industrious, he's got great stamina, and I want the wingbacks in this side to push really high up the pitch. It might sound like I'm trying to convince myself with this one, but whilst I would rather have Kulusevski playing on the right, or just a tailor-made world-class left wingback at my disposal, of the available options, I think that this is probably the best one, or at least, the least bad option. Defensive midfield, Pierre-Emil Hojbjerg. Another Scandinavian currently plying his trade in North London, Pierre-Emil Hojbjerg is a teammate of Dejan Kulusevski's at Tottenham Hotspur, and he will no doubt be delighted to discover that I've picked him in his actual position. 
I know that they're fourth, at least, at the time of this recording, but I can count the number of times I've watched Spurs under Antonio Conte and thought they actually played really well on a single hand. The same is not true of Hojbjerg, however, who has been outstanding this season and has proved to be an absolute bargain ever since his £15 million arrival at Tottenham from Southampton. Still aged only 27, Hojbjerg himself admits that he isn't as naturally gifted as most of his teammates, but he makes up for that with his work rate, energy levels, and sheer power of will. He must be one of the fittest players in world football. No, not like that. And in a position with not inconsiderable competition from Scandinavia, he still comes out comfortably on top. Central midfield, Christian Eriksen. He might hail from the extremely unfortunately named Danish town of Middelfart, but Christian Eriksen has bounced back from that initial embarrassment early in his life to have a sensational career within the sport. The third successive inclusion in this 11 with links to Tottenham, Eriksen spent seven seasons starring for Spurs as by far the best signing that the club made when reinvesting the proceeds of Gareth Bale's world record-breaking sale to Real Madrid. A graduate of the outstanding Ajax youth ranks, Eriksen is one of the most naturally gifted midfielders that we have seen in Europe over the past decade, with a tremendous combination of vision, technique, and weight of pass. No longer a routine scorer and creator of goals from attacking midfield, Eriksen plays a little deeper these days, and his loss to injury has certainly been felt at Manchester United. Eriksen managed to unite the world of football almost two years ago, though regrettably so, in the hope that he would survive the cardiac arrest that he suffered midway through Denmark's Euro 2020 tie with Finland. Thankfully, he did just that, and incredibly, he not only returned to the sport with Brentford, but he made such an impression that he was signed by one of the biggest clubs in world football. Capped 120 times by Denmark, Eriksen will soon overtake Peter Schmeichel as the country's all-time most capped player, and he was one of the first names in my 11. Central midfield, Martin Erdegaard. Arguably the Premier League player of the season so far this season, and if not then, not too far off, Martin Erdegaard has gone from being a tidy and polished performer at Arsenal to a deadly match winner and constant threat on goal. With a combined 15 goals and assists in the league this season, Kevin De Bruyne is the only midfielder with more, one more to be exact, as Erdegaard finally looks to be realising the potential that so many people thought he had when Real Madrid signed him at the age of 15. Famously, Erdegaard was reportedly given an £80,000 a week contract at 15, and whilst that is, obviously, an extremely fortunate position to be in, it is also one capable of melting anyone's brain and destroying their career before it has even begun. Erdegaard's progress hasn't been linear, but he's never gone away. And at the age of 24, he has already won 47 caps for Norway and looks like one of the best midfielders in the world. Centre forward, Alexander Isak. Whilst his straight partner's inclusion in this 11 was always a foregone conclusion, Alexander Isak's spot was one with a few really strong contenders. Sometimes when you watch Alexander Isak, you wonder why he isn't in Ballon d'Or contention. Quick, clever, brilliant on the ball, and six foot four inches tall, he looks to have it all. And he did score 14 goals in 18 games for Willem Tway in the 2018-19 season, and 17 in 34 for Real Sociedad in 2020-21. Hey, look at that, I've reunited them. However, Isaac isn't in Ballon d'Or contention, or even anywhere near it, he has thus far failed to put it all together and produce consistent top-class performances at the highest level, and outside of those two seasons that I just mentioned, his output has tended to underwhelm. Nonetheless, I really enjoy watching him play, he is still only 23, and his ceiling is by far the highest of anyone who was competing for this spot. Signed for a club record £63 million by Newcastle last summer, Injuries have disrupted Isaac's start to life at St. James's Park, where he has bagged just three goals in 13 games, and he has scored nine goals from 37 caps for Sweden since making his debut in 2017. Centre forward, 
Erling Haaland. The star of this side, and a very easy pick at centre forward, is of course Erling Haaland. Already arguably the greatest Norwegian footballer of all time, and certainly the greatest in terms of his peak, Haaland was actually born in Leeds whilst his father was playing for Leeds United, but the family moved to Norway when he was three years old, and there was never any doubt about which country he would represent. At the age of 22, Haaland has already scored 21 goals from 23 caps for Norway, which puts him just 11 goals off breaking Jorgen Juve's all-time goal-scoring record for the country, which has stood for some 86 years. Haaland partnering Isak would make for one of the tallest strike partnerships in the history of world football, and certainly the tallest that I'm aware of in the international game at this moment in time. Haaland is 6 foot 5 inches tall, frighteningly quick when he reaches top speed, and his movement within the box is outstanding. He's also an absolute menace in the air, and he has enough power in his left foot to send a football into orbit. He completes this 11 and utterly transforms it, especially with the likes of Barr, Kulusevski, Eriksson, Erdegaard, and even Isaac providing for him. I have named a seven-man bench, even though they're not very common in international football, but, you know, nor is the union of three independent states, and you've already embellished me this far, which is made up of Kasper Schmeichel, Jürgen Mähler, Simon Kjar, Frederick Arsnes, who is probably the most unfortunate player to miss out, due to an abundance of talent in central midfield, Emil Forsberg, Jasper Carlsen, and Alexander Soloff. Two Norwegians, Ersnes and Sorloff, could easily have featured, though Ersnes would probably have necessitated some kind of a system change, meanwhile Sorloff only narrowly missed out to Isak, currently enjoying a really good season in La Liga with Real Sociedad. Now, to be totally honest, if you were to include the other Nordic countries, Iceland and Finland, I am afraid to say that, at least at this moment in time, I don't think much would change. I would be sympathetic to the idea of bringing Finland number one Lukas Radetzky in between the sticks, who I like a lot, but even that seems harsh on Frederik Romov. Elsewhere, I don't think that anyone else would really even make the bench. So, would a unified Scandinavian eleven win the FIFA World Cup? Probably not. They're still a little bit light at fullback, the centre-backs, whilst good, are still bettered by most of the real international powerhouses, and there isn't an enormous amount of depth. The midfield and attack is truly elite, though, and could surely take them close. Let me know what you think down below in the comments, but that is it for today's video. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel, and indeed my backup channel, and turn on notifications, both of which should be on your screens now, making it, you know, quite frankly effortless to do so, and you can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.